Hello everyone, what's up? In this Star Wars painting tutorial, I'll show you how I painted and weathered this 3D printed Imperial probe droid and two different scenic bases. More specifically, I will cover the process in six parts. Part 1 Priming Part 2 Metallic Undercoat Part 3 Base Coat and Chipping Part 4 Enamel Wash Part 5 Finishing Touches and Part 6 Diorama Bases Towards the end, I will also share my conclusions about this build and the model itself. This video is divided into chapters, so you can more easily review particular techniques if you like. Let's get started, shall we? Time to get the model primed. My primer of choice here, same as with this nail tank, was AK Black Primer with Microfiller. This lacquer primer is highly toxic, but it is my weapon of choice when I want the finish to be extra durable. As always, I went with a thin mist first, gradually increasing the opacity with successive light coats. Please note that I'm spraying the primer without any dilution at 20 psi. Other than that, the trick is to keep the airbrush in motion and to keep the distance to the model roughly the same throughout the process. If you want to replicate these steps but you don't have access to an airbrush, a booth and a respirator, I would recommend a rattle can primer, like the army painter ones for example. These are lacquers as well, and will also provide you with a tough finish. After a few minutes, the model had a nice uniform coat of primer, and I was very happy with the results. In preparation for the next stage, I let everything dry for 24 hours. As usual with many of my projects in 2022, I went with an undercoat of AK Extreme Metal Gunmetal. That's quite a mouthful, isn't it? In any case, this is an enamel paint, which requires no thinning and sprays absolutely beautifully. Like before, I went for a pressure of 20 psi and I made sure to keep the airbrush constantly in motion. As you can see, coverage is amazing. And the metallic flake that you get is super fine, much more so than with most other paints. Even though the primer was matte, you can see that with a few more light coats, the finish is already starting to get really shiny and reflective. If you want to ensure an even more realistic finish, apply it over a satin or gloss black instead. By the way, this enamel paint is also super tough if you let it dry for 24 hours or so. Much harder to scratch than any acrylics. Why is that relevant? Well, as you will see later, this is a big plus for me. All in all, this only took me 7 minutes from start to finish and I think the results speak for themselves. With the primer and the metallic undercoat both done, it was time to spray some chipping fluid. This product is completely transparent and leaves no trace when dry. But for best results, one should apply two thin coats. However, in some spots, I was a little bit trigger-happy, shall we say, and kind of gave the area a bit of a shower. So guys, do as I say, not as I do. After 30 minutes, the droid was completely dry and it was time for the black base coat. Same as with the spider droid and the snail tank, I went with Tamiya LP5, which is a semi-gloss black lacquer paint. Now, since lacquer paints don't react much to chipping fluid, I went with AK Thinner, which makes this paint a sort of happy medium between water-based acrylic, on the one hand, which tend to come off in big flakes, and true lacquers, on the other, which basically will not chip at all. Anyway, the thinning ratio was 50-50, and the pressure 20 psi once again. As you have already seen, I built up opacity very, very gradually this time. You could go more aggressive, of course, but this way will guarantee you best results. Now, time to get the model under the needle, as I always say. Not in vain, this is what I call needle chipping. As you can see, the area needs to be slightly wet first. Then, I go in with an old airbrush needle to physically scratch the black paint revealing the metal undercoat. I concentrate on panel lines and small surface details, like rivets, 
in order to create the impression that the paint is worn out. As you can see, it's possible to create really fine chips and under close scrutiny, it is very easy to spot the difference between these and chips that have been painted or sponged on. So if realism is your thing, this is the way to go. Here you can see how I apply water to the next area to be chipped. The trick is not to flood the area, but rather just make it damp. This is now the fifth model to which I apply needle chipping. This has allowed me to fine tune the process and I feel like I have a lot of control now over both the placement and the size of the chips. Much more so than with any other method I have to say. After I was done, I first let the model dry for a couple of hours and then I applied a clear coat of Tamiya X22, which is a kind of gloss varnish. This would both seal the paint job and prepare it for the enamel wash. Now it was time for an enamel wash with ammo track wash diluted about 30% with odorless thinner. The idea is to lightly touch a panel line or some protruding detail and let the wash flow by itself as much as possible. Capillary action was enhanced thanks to the generous clear coat that I had applied off camera prior to this step. The brush that you use is not really a decisive factor, I would say, but I love the control that I get with this synthetic liner brush, also by Ammo of MIG. In these close up shots, you can appreciate better the level of detail that this 3D printed model has and also how well it lends itself to pin washing. I must say, pin washing this was both very easy and quite enjoyable for me. Once I was done, I let the model dry for two hours and then I got ready to remove some of the excess wash with a sponge. Rubbing the sponge against the grain, so to speak, will leave the wash in the recessed areas while cleaning up any buildup from the flatter panels. Since the wash was dry but far from cured, this is very easy to do and gives you really solid results. Before we start with the two diorama bases, let's look at this drawing in the eyes, shall we? My method for lenses or stuff like this is pretty straightforward. Over the satin black, I apply a coat of scale 75 black metal, slightly thinned. I'm careful to leave some of the black showing which will give us a sort of natural shading effect later on. Make sure to have a good grip on your model and to turn it around so that you can reach every part more easily. So, this is our first eye, done for now. Here are two more. It's important to thin the paint enough so that it doesn't create texture, but not so much that it runs down. The next step is to create a smaller circle with a lighter metallic. In this case, I went for speed metal, also by scale 75. This silver paint is much more temperamental, and here I wasn't following my own advice about thinning. On this last one, I diluted the paint a little bit more, but it was still kind of clumpy. Anyways, I'm sure you can do better. Now for the really cool part, the clear red. After diluting the paint around 20%, Using AK High Compatibility Thinner, I applied a thin first coat, taking care to spread the paint evenly. After a few minutes, I apply a much bigger blob of paint, which I basically deposit on the surface, letting it flow by itself. After a couple of coats, you will get a really nice deep red that looks very convincing. So here is the finished model, which has a nice contrast between the worn out black paint job and the shiny, somewhat unsettling lenses. Next we will look at the two diorama bases. So here is the larger of my two bases, which are made out of foam board and plastic art. I will show you how to make these rocks out of plaster in a future video, but for now let us look at how to give them 
a convincing, realistic look. The product that I'm using for this is a set of liquid pigments by Woodland Scenics. We'll use grey, umber, green and black. These liquid pigments are really dense out of the bottle and they should be diluted until they have the consistency of a wash. Here is a raw umber. I'm going with 8 parts water to 1 part paint. After pouring in the water, make sure to give it a good mix. After getting all 4 colors ready, I prepare to apply some dots of umber. Much like with a wash, the idea is not to paint the product, but to touch the surface and let the liquid pigment flow by capillary action. Since plaster is very porous, it will quickly absorb the liquid pigments. Now for the other accent color, green. Just dab at white areas, but don't be afraid to mix the two colors. They will blend seamlessly and add to the realism later on. What we are applying now is the primary color, grey, which I'm applying to the remaining white spots. Yes, I know this looks quite garish at the moment, but you just have to trust the process. And here is the rock, kind of painted, in just a couple of minutes. While I let the big rock dry for a few minutes, I repeated the same process on the smaller piece. Again, it's umber, followed by green, followed by grey, piece of cake. Now back to our big rock. We're now applying black all over the place. This will not only add a lot of shading, like a wash, but it will also unify the colors, reducing the garish effect that we saw before. At the same time, however, you will notice that a lot of raised edges remain white or grey, just as if we had dry brushed the model, which I didn't, but without the artificial, chalky finish that dry brushing almost always causes. Lastly, I mixed raw umber and slate grey and thinned it some more until I had something pretty much like dirty water. I then applied this selectively to any areas which were a bit too yellowish for my liking. And here you have the finished rock. Now let us look at how to create a snow scene. I'll show you the Star Wars Legion base first. This is just a regular Legion base with some foam board on top which I pressed down in order to allow the rock to sit more naturally and be covered with snow in a realistic fashion. The snow paste that I'm applying here is called Flex Paste, which is very easy to work with and dries very quickly. The area in the middle I did not cover in Flex Paste because, as it happens, that will not adhere to plaster. Instead, I just applied some super glue to make sure that our rock won't be going anywhere. Once the rock was in place, I applied some more paste, especially to the area around the rock. This product is Hobby Sand Thick by Green Stuff World, which in actual fact is real gravel. So I think it really should be called Hobby Gravel. <laughs> in any case, what I'm trying to do here is two things. First, I wanted to create more volume. And second, I wanted to add some more texture, even though my intention was to cover the gravel with more snow. So I just kind of moved the gravel around, pushing it this way and that, and then covered it with some more flex paste. This whole thing was fun and relaxing, almost therapeutic I would say. At this point I could see the base taking shape and really beginning to recreate the image which I had in mind when I started. After this I let the base dry for an hour. The next step was another layer of flex paste which would then be followed by some snow flock. By now, the paste was beginning to obscure the gravel completely, but I think it did its job by providing both volume and an irregular surface. If the surface had been all perfectly smooth and even, it would have looked completely unrealistic. Once I was done with the paste, I got ready to try yet another product that was entirely new for me. Soft Flake Snow by Woodland Scenics. 
as you can see, my clumsy attempt at pouring the snow directly from its huge container was pretty hilarious. In any case, the effect on top of the paste was really good. Now I'm applying AK Interactive Sand and Gravel Fixer in preparation for their much vaunted snow micro balloons, which are much finer than the soft flake snow, but also twice as expensive. So yeah, you really want to make sure that the AK stuff stays in place. Anyway, after carefully applying the snow, I added some more fixer. As this is alcohol based, it penetrates the snow very easily. About an hour later, I drilled the hole for the flying stem, added some more fixer, and then some more AK micro balloons. Hilarious name, by the way. After this, the base was looking really good, and all that was left was to paint the rim black, as I always do with all my bases. Okay, so here you have the much larger square base. I attached all three rocks with super glue and then applied some more flex paste, taking care to blend the rocks as much as possible with the rest of the base. I also applied some paste to the areas of the rocks, which I wanted to portray as covered with snow. So time for the frosting on the cake, or rather the first layer of snow flock. To see this mini diorama taking shape before me was again really gratifying. The next step you can already guess. I applied again the snow and gravel fixer quite liberally. Next came the micro balloons of course. Over the rocks they created a really believable effect of powder snow. So I guess the high price warranted in this case. In any case, I was enjoying myself so much at this stage that I decided to give it another pass with both the soft flake snow and the micro balloons. I must say I'm really proud of the end result, especially given that this was the very first time that I had done any snow base of any sort. So what are my conclusions about this project? Well, first of all, let me tell you that Empire has been my favorite film since I was four years old, literally. I came across the STL for the Imperial Probe Droid a few weeks ago and I immediately knew that I had to have it. Now I've enjoyed all the Star Wars models that I've done, to different degrees of course, but this is the most fun I had with any of them since the ATST. To my surprise, a big part of that has been the snow bases. I wanted to learn something new. I wanted to try new products and I wanted to see how it got on with this kind of mini diorama. In any case, I hope that you've all enjoyed this video because this is far from the last hot themed video that you're going to see from me. So stay tuned for more wintry hobby content at the Race for Terra. As always, I would like to thank all my Patreon supporters. Your generosity, guys, helps me keep the lights on and it makes a big difference to me. Thank you all, and remember, keep it up and weather it out.